Hello, class of 2027. This is your first year class dean, Christina Walsh. I use she, they pronouns, and it's great to see you again. I assume you've all been eagerly awaiting the information we're going to be presenting to you today about academic information, registration, how it works here, advising, etc. cetera. Uh, this tutorial is really meant to get you set up for the next steps of your onboarding process to Williams College. I'm here today with my wonderful, co wonderful colleague, Alan. Alan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Yeah, my name is Alan Hatton. Uh, I'm a senior associate registrar here at the college. I use he, him pronouns, and uh, I'm excited to share this information with you. Great. And with that, I am going to go ahead and turn this slide and let Alan kick us off. Go for it. Sure. So this, we're just going to talk about the things we're going to cover, uh, the academic calendar, uh, placement information, so how to how to uh, figure out which classes you'll be you'll be joining, uh, pre-registration and registration, uh, your academic advisor, academic policies, and first days. That's right, Alan. Um, we're, we are going to cover a lot of ground. Our goal is to be about maybe 30, 35 minutes. So settle in, grab a snack if you need to. Um, so let's talk about that first item, the academic calendar. It doesn't sound super exciting, but I can't tell you just how important this is gonna to be to your success, your management of your stress, uh, feeling informed about different options that you might wanna consider throughout your time uh, at Williams. So the academic calendar is actually available to you on the website through the registrar's office. And what I have here is an example of two ways in which you can view the academic calendar. As you see, if you kind of squint, look closely at the print, um, there are a lot of really major key deadlines that are super important for most students to be aware of each and every semester. It's not just about when is vacation or when is homecoming, but really there are so many academic um, process deadlines that you may not think at this point might apply to you, but I guarantee you at some point, you're gonna wanna know um, What's the deadline for pass fail option? Uh, what's the deadline for uh, add drop or withdrawing? Or very importantly, what are the dates for pre-registration and registration? Uh, we'll get more into some of these processes in a moment, but at this point, what I'm really hoping you will take to heart is that being aware of these uh, academic deadlines is gonna be super important. Glancing ahead, kind of get a, get a look a week or two out. Um, and keep up on it. Uh, so the, the example at the bottom right corner, if you download the academic calendar to your GCAL, which is what most students at Williams College use, you can have it up on your weekly calendar in this purple uh, format, and you can, you can just always have it right in front of you along with your class schedule and everything else. So in this example, you'll see um, that top line talks about the drop ad period that typically happens during the beginning a uh, couple of weeks of the semester. Um, it also uh, would include uh, drop deadlines for certain types of courses. You'll see here Wednesday um, uh, or, or classes resume on Friday the 3rd. You'll want to know exactly what this is so you can plan your, your free time, plan your academic obligation time, plan to balance your big papers and maybe your P sets in a particular class, but keeping track of, of these deadlines is going to be super important. Again, managing your stress, managing the flow of all of your obligations here. Um, so we'll talk more about this during first days. Uh, we'll go over the importance of the academic calendar. One thing I really want to say uh, that I hope you will remember is the majority of the deadlines in the academic calendar are not flexible. If you miss a deadline to withdraw from a course, there is nothing anyone can do to change that. So again, that's a really good example of why it's important to be aware of what's going on in the academic calendar all throughout the semester. Alan, you want to talk about placement? Sure, sounds good. So um, Williams uses a num number of tools uh, to help students get placed into, into classes. Um, the, the first is the Williams Quantitative Literacy and Reasoning Assessment. This is a required assessment. You've already received information on it. Uh, you, you can participate in this assessment via GLOW. 
it's due uh, July 20th. Uh, and what this does is it helps us uh, advise students on how to navigate the um, quantitative and formal reasoning requirement that Williams has for all students. Uh, all students need to complete that to, to complete the degree. Um, you will not be able to register for a course until you complete this, or QFR course, until you complete this assessment. So it's really important to do so. Uh, and uh, Nick Hanford, a director, director of quantitative skills programs is a resource to you if you have any questions about, about the assessment or what QFR course you should, you should be taking. Uh, in addition to that, each department, well, not all departments, but many departments have their own uh, placement assessments or tools. There is a, there's a page on the first year site that lists them all and describes uh, who should be taking which ones with which departments. Uh, sometimes they're in GLOW, sometimes they're in person, uh, sometimes they're in maybe via other methods. Uh, each department does it, does it differently. Um, so that's another uh, uh, place that you'll want to pay attention to uh, in order to, to figure out which courses you should take. The last um, type of placement that we have is the external uh, test score. So AP exams, uh, IB exams, et cetera. You'll wanna have your official score reports uh, submitted to the college. These will end up going right on uh, your internal transcript. This is not your external transcript, but it's an internal document that we use at the college that will um, show you, if you look at it, which courses, um, you, which courses are recommended that you take. Um, and when in doubt, uh, really just ask faculty. If you feel like you aren't sure about what, what the right you know, calculus course is for you, for example, go ask the faculty. If you think that, um, if you find that you're not able to register for a course because of one of these placement uh, tools that you, that you think you really should be in, go talk to the faculty. They, they can help you navigate all these things. Um, so, and with that, I'll hand it back to Christina. Thanks, Alan. One more thing about placements. I've been receiving uh, several, uh, a number of emails from, from uh, the class of 27. And I just want to clarify for those of you who might still be wondering, if you have no intention of taking a language, if you have no intention of taking a biology course, if your interests lie somewhere else, your path is elsewhere, you don't need to take those uh, placement exams. It's really uh, intended to assess where you might begin in a certain area, as Alan was describing, uh, if you're going to take coursework in those areas. So there's no requirement for placement exams. The only exception to that would be the WQLRA. Right, Alan? That's right. Great, all right. Now the moment you've all been waiting for, how does registration at Williams College work? Um, we have this thing called pre-registration. Before we get into this, I wanna talk about, um, the reality is that uh, it is a Williams thing. We call it that for a reason. You probably have friends that are uh, beginning uh, to, uh, to, to attend other colleges and universities, getting information about their other registration systems at other colleges, and you'll probably be comparing notes. Um, so please don't expect our registration system to look anything like your friend's registration systems at other colleges. Um, so just focus on uh, what we're gonna share with you right now so you can really learn how this works. Before too long, it'll just be a normal thing, but right now it might sound a little weird. Um, so our pre-registration is really like signing up for a wish list. So you've all probably been looking at the course catalog, getting a sense of what your first semester might look like as you probably know at this point, every semester, Williams students take four classes. Very few exceptions to that. Uh, we won't get into those exceptions in today's session, but plan on taking four classes. You cannot take less than four classes and taking more is a situational, situational um, thing that uh, requires additional conversation. So. So when you're looking at that course catalog and you're putting together, uh, you know, your a la carte menu of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, maybe some math, maybe some art history, um, maybe some ancient Greek, who knows, whatever it might be that you want to start with. Again, think of it not as I know what this is going to look like. I have my first semester completely planned out. You, you might if you're lucky, but you probably don't. It is a wish list. Um, and 
the reason we do that is because um, our process here is overseen by the faculty and for some pretty good reasons too. Um, they, the, the faculty will look at the list of students who have signed up in pre-registration for their class and they'll assess what the class needs are and what the list of students needs are. In other words, if, um, if I'm a professor and I'm teaching a class uh, that uh, tends to uh, be primarily first year students, but I have to reserve a certain number of spaces for seniors who this is their only chance to take that course to satisfy their major requirement and graduate on time, I have to reserve a few seats for them. Um, or maybe the reverse is true. Maybe you really wanna take a class that mostly juniors and seniors take and there's just a handful of spots in there um, uh, for first years. Well, if there's only five seats for first years and 15 first years put it on their wish list, the faculty have to make really complex decisions about how to be fair and make sure that the right mix of people are in that class and that those seats go to who they're intended for. There's a little bit of a mysterious element to this. I can't give you all of the exact details of why certain things happen, but the most important thing for you to know is that again, it's a wish list and the end result may not look exactly like you had hoped, which is why it's so important for you to have plan B or backup classes in mind and not to be too disappointed um, if you don't get all of the classes you wanted. That's very normal here. It happens to most students, um, especially the first couple of years. Um, but the way it actually pans out is that really all students get the courses they need to satisfy their major and, and to graduate on time in the end anyway. So don't worry about that. Your flexibility is going to be very important and it will reduce your stress level. So another thing about pre-registration is that even if the number of students who sign up for a class exceeds the number of seats in that class, there's a wait list that gets created. And a lot of people will have to shift uh, what they put in pre-registration and spots open up. So getting on that wait list is, is often worth it. And I'm gonna give you a really important tip right now. If you really want that class, you're just, your heart is set on it. Um, maybe you have a special connection to the topic. Uh, maybe you've done some, some studies related to it in a certain way, um, whatever it might be, get on that wait list and then do something what, what might seem really daring at this point in your education, email the professor and let them know you're on the wait list, you're excited to have the opportunity, why you really want to be in that class, they'll remember you. And if that, if that spot opens up, it's very possible that you will get it. The other really important tip about the wait list is the following. If you are on a wait list for a class, you have to attend the first session of that class. You have to be physically present in that space. It doesn't mean you're, you have any higher chance of getting that spot, but if you are not there and that spot opens up and your name is called, you will not get that spot. So if you really want the class and you're on the wait list, plan that during the first week of courses, attend that first session, keep your fingers crossed, hope for the best, and just know that your presence um, is required uh, if that spot opens up for you. Another thing about instructor consent, there are a number of courses here that will require instructor consent. Um, something you're gonna hear a lot about is that students and faculty actually communicate regularly here. That is super important and very much um, not as prominent at other colleges and universities. Emailing a professor and saying, hey, your course requires consent. Um, maybe uh, it's a super high level and they wanna make sure that you have some background in it. Start the, start the conversation, um, see if you can get their consent. They might uh, uh, allow you to um, open up that spot for you uh, and sign up during pre-registration. Do not hesitate to contact faculty and express interest in, in their course offerings, the work they do, their research, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they wanna hear from you. They're used to hearing from first years who are eager to join their courses. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about communicating with faculty and some additional tips during first days. We'll be spending a lot of time together talking about this topic, um, but I've just given you at least a handful of ways to just reach out. I'm interested. 
um, very excited about the content of this course, or hey, even, wow, I looked into your research background. I'm so excited by what you do and really look forward to taking classes with you. Is there any chance um, I can get in on, on your course this semester? Those emails happen every single semester from students at all levels here. I'm gonna turn the next list over to Alan to talk about the shopping cart and what it is. Yeah, sure, happy to, yeah. And one thing I'll just add really quickly about um, uh, instructor consent and, um, you know, preferences is the, the catalog does describe, uh, there's a section in the catalog for each course that describes the enrollment preferences. So it'll give you some idea of how faculty are, um, you know, determining who should, who should uh, get those seats. And then um, if, a, if a course does over enroll during pre-registration, uh, from that point on, it will automatically have instructor consent on. And that's precisely so that faculty can manage the wait lists that, that Dean Walsh was referring to. Um, so you'll see, you'll see that a lot in the second round of registration, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So the shopping cart, yeah. So registering, the, the, the act of registration at the college is a lot like online shopping. Um, it's, it's a multi-step process. So, you know, you're in, you're in our system, uh, Williams Student Records, you're looking for courses, you're, you find one that you're interested, that you think you'd like to take, you add it to your shopping cart. Um, and uh, once you've built a schedule that you feel like you are, are, are once you feel like you're ready to, to, to enroll in that particular course, you will, um, you will then uh, submit that shopping cart. Um, and then after you submit that cart, uh, you will, um, the, the system will prompt you to review the, to view the results. So um, in some cases, you, you'll see a, a green check mark that says, you know, you've registered for the course, congratulations. In other cases, you might see a red X and, a, and an error message. Uh, and this may be, uh, the error message may be due to any number of reasons. Uh, you're missing a prerequisite, uh, the course is, is full, um, you know, instructor consent is required. Uh, so it's really important to work through all three of those steps. And, and there are detailed instructions on our website. It's really important to, to work through all three of those steps to ensure that you've, you've registered for the courses that you, that you want to. Um, and that, and if there is an error, pay attention to those messages and um, reach out to the registrar's office uh, if you have any questions about what they're telling you, because we can, we can help you, um, you know, navigate those. Um, and then view, view your schedule afterwards. It's always uh, really important to, once you, once you think you're done, view your schedule just to make sure that everything looks right uh, because it is a multi-step process. And, and so you really just wanna ensure that you have um, you know, com completed all the steps. Uh, so, so, so after pre-registration, um, you know, faculty will, will do that process that, that Dean Walsh was, was speaking of, they'll review their rosters and, and determine, um, you know, for over-enrolled courses, uh, who, who should be in that class. Uh, and if you are dropped from a class that you signed up for a pre-registration, you'll have the opportunity to, to fill out your schedule during the next, next round of registration. Uh, and in this round is, is more like a normal um, you know, more like the registration uh, systems that your friends might be talking about at other schools, where it's primarily first come, first serve. Um, so they're, they're, you know, each course has a, an enrollment limit. And if there are, is a seat available in the course and you meet the prerequisites, uh, you can sign up. And once you sign up at this point, you're in, you're in the class. Um, so you don't have to worry about being dropped after the second round, more like a traditional, traditional, um, registration period. Uh, one thing I'll note also is that for multi-section courses, so say there is a lecture and three or four labs, um, faculty will often balance enrollments across those sections um, so that there's not, you know, 30 students in one class and five in another. Uh, so you may find that you've been, been moved from one lab section to another uh, to balance uh, out those enrollments. And that typically happens between, between pre-registration and registration uh, as well. So it's a good idea after, um, after you pre-register for courses uh, to sort of have some backup courses in mind in the event that you do get dropped from your first choice. Uh, and then to, to, to log on to Williams Student Records as soon as registration opens 
to try to, to snag a seat in those other courses. Um, on the next slide, we'll, we have the dates here for you. Uh, so uh, first year pre-registration is, is August 7th through August 11th. And then um, uh, faculty adjust enrollments between the 11th and the 21st. And then that's when the next round of registration opens up. There's also a third round uh, at the beginning of the semester, the drop bad period. Um, and so you have another opportunity to make adjustments to your schedule. Although like Christina noted, it's really important that you've attended the first class session of any course you hope to add during that, during that um, uh, session, because it's required. Okay. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, super helpful. Hopefully you all took some notes, but you're obviously able to kind of rewatch that really important, uh, those last five, five minutes or so, uh, super critical of understanding. Um, so I want to talk about how to put together a, a good class schedule and um, what that really looks like at Williams College, particularly for, for the first year experience. Um, there's no, there's no uh, mistake about, or it's not just random, that our first point here is talking about self-care. Um, I have no doubt that I am currently speaking to an audience of very driven uh, academic high achievers, or you would not be coming to Williams College. And when, despite your accomplishments and your intelligence and the habits and the drive that got you here, uh, things will change for you as soon as you start school at Williams College. It will change. It will not look like high school. A lot of you will be um, adapting new habits and new skill sets uh, that you didn't utilize maybe in high school or community college or whatever your educational background was. Um, those formulas may or may not serve you well here um, because of the workload, the academic and intellectual rigor, um, and frankly, uh, a lot of the uh, additional activities and opportunities that you no doubt are going to want to participate in uh, once the semester starts. So I just, I'm, I really want to encourage you all to, um, to be open to the idea that adjustment and adaptation is probably going to be a huge part of your first semester journey. And it doesn't mean that what you were doing before was wrong, but it might just need some nuance and adaptation um, uh, to 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 be successful here, and and this is actually a really good opportunity uh, to share with y'all um, that I met with about forty five percent of the first year class individually, one on one, last year during uh, mostly during the fall semester. Most of those students reached out to me because they wanted to have conversations around this kind of thing. Uh, with me to try to uh, get some guidance um, and some support uh, to, to really adjust to Williams and the rigor uh, and expectations that we have here. So this isn't meant to scare you. It's meant to just sort of give you a heads up that be open to that kind of change. And that really does matter when it comes to putting a course schedule together. If you are driven and you are academically successful and you are used to that identity, it might feel like taking two lab courses during your first semester is totally manageable. I'm gonna tell you right now, for most people, it is not. And I say most people, uh, there are always gonna be exceptions, um, but it's not a competition to be that exception. Um, what we would much rather see is something reasonable and balanced um, so that you can take care of yourself while you're going through all of this change and uh, adaptation to being a college student. So um, know your needs. Uh, think about yourself. What are your habits? How have you been successful so far? Um, think about what might need to change. Uh, if you plow through high school on six hours of sleep a night, that's great. You might find that nothing less than eight is going to be good enough for you when you get here. Um, that's just a possible example. Um, you might uh, uh, feel compelled to study in isolation um, to keep up and manage your academic obligations, um, but that also requires that in your uh, class schedule time, you need to make sure that there's opportunities for social interaction and um, being present in, in the community 
uh, in a way that works for you. So don't try to pack it all in is the point. Don't try to um, slam everything into the first semester. Think of the first semester as an easing in period. Um, I know the excitement and the eagerness is probably very much present. You all want to get started. You want to get here, get things going. Um, but also take the foot off the, the gas pedal a little bit if you can and recognize that for the vast majority of you, um, the better plan is to uh, uh, create a schedule that is reasonable, manageable, um, has a balanced workload. Um, you might have a class with a ton of reading and writing, a class that has a lot of P sets, um, and, uh, and, and maybe one, one lab course. Uh, that could work for some, and for others, it's not going to work. But think about your needs um, and what is going to help keep you healthy throughout the semester. Um, what we don't want is that eagerness to convert into burnout. Uh, there are a significant number of students that come and talk to me in the fall semester uh, about burnout. Um, and uh, it's, it's you would be surprised. It's frequently not at the end of the semester that they experience burnout. Quite often it's in the middle of the semester um, because they put too much on too soon. Um, and for some of them didn't reach out for the support uh, that might have helped them manage things better of which I am a very important one. And please don't forget that. So there's also something else to uh, think about. Um, it's hard to imagine what you don't know, but um, really a lot can happen in life at college that you are unexpected, that is unexpected for you. Uh, for instance, you might catch the flu right as midterms are, are popping up and not able to read, concentrate, or study. Um, you know, you might suffer a, a workout injury, hopefully not too serious, um, which requires you to tend to some medical needs. You, you may have another personal event that pulls you away from your academics. When those things happen, communicating with faculty, like we mentioned before, and also communicating with me, um, we have a lot of systems in place to help you through those times. The reason I put it here is that it's harder to deal with those unexpected on those unexpected events in life when your schedule is really unnecessarily jam-packed. Um, so ease up, especially as you are easing into being a college student. Um, and then being open and willing to, to shift and change. And I think we've already talked a bit about um, how things are gonna be different despite what you know and what's worked for you in the past. Well, there are a lot of systems in place here and a lot of people in place to help you kind of explore um, how to make those shifts and changes when, when it seems like it's time for you to do so. So think about that when you're putting your wish list together for pre-registration. Um, please don't overload yourselves. Um, and obviously you're gonna have a chance to talk about all of this with your academic advisor as well. Um, so let's talk about academic advising and how that works. Um, our academic advisors are faculty, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and not only do they know their field pretty well, but they really do know um, a variety of different interests, uh, different course paths. Um, you may wind up with an academic advisor who uh, and you know, we make a pretty good effort to match, but not everyone's going to match up perfectly. Uh, you may wind up wanting to be uh, a STEM major, maybe majoring in physics, um, and have an, uh, your initial academic advisor might be an art history professor. Don't worry if that happens to you. They still know what they're doing. Um, and frankly, they can also uh, have great conversations with you about one of the best aspects of coming to a liberal arts college like Williams, and that is exploring um, uh, intellectual pursuits that you may not have any experience with or um, may not have thought uh, of exploring in the past. So work with your academic advisor. Um, don't worry if they are not in your field of interest, um, they will serve you well. And for, if for some strange reason they don't, talk to me and we can make some adjustments for you. Um, as a first year, like I said, you're gonna have, you're gonna be assigned an academic advisor. Um, that academic advisor is gonna be yours 
through your sophomore year until you declare a major at the end of your sophomore year. And at that time, you will be assigned a new academic advisor who will be called your major advisor. Uh, and that will be a professor in uh, your uh, declared major department. So whoever you have now is likely gonna be your person for the next two years. Um, so it's a great opportunity to develop a connection with them and really learn from them. Um, so how are they chosen and why? Uh, there's a whole algorithm out there that takes your preferences, looks at our pool of academic advisors and tries to do the best matching based on interests. But again, it's not a perfect one-on-one -on -one situation. So if, again, if you just, if you wind up with an academic advisor that is not in your area of interest, see it as an opportunity to learn about something new. It doesn't mean you have to take courses in that area, um, but it might just open and broaden uh, some different opportunities for you, and they will be able to serve you well regardless. So when do you meet with them? Well, oh, well, first of all, you're going to get an email on July 27th revealing to you who your academic advisor is and how to connect with them. They will be uh, inviting you to uh, set up a time to meet with them uh, virtually, uh, and those meetings will happen uh, from Monday, July 31st through Friday, August 11th. Um, they'll be rather short meetings, kind of introductory, just to kind of get you uh, grounded in and prepared for pre-registration, um, just initial conversation. Again, you're going to know them for two years. This is their first opportunity to get to know you, um, but be excited about it. They are eager to, to meet you and welcome you and help you navigate these processes. Um, I mentioned before, if there's ever an issue with your academic advisor, every once in a while, somebody might take a sabbatical um, with, uh, and, and have to step away for a semester uh, or for whatever reason, have to step away from their academic advising role. If that happens, we're usually aware of it. But if for some reason your advisor has left and nobody's contacted you, just, just email me. Um, I could certainly help arrange uh, for a new advisor to be assigned to you, but usually you'll hear from us in those situations. Additionally, if you cannot get a hold of your advisor, this isn't very common at all, but you've got to get um, a hold lifted to, uh, to, to do registration, um, please reach out to me. Any dean in the dean's office uh, can help you if I'm not around, but certainly I am happy to be uh, your main uh, backup advisor, advisor uh, in situations like that. And that actually reminds me of something we didn't mention yet, Alan, and that's about the hold. Why do we have a hold for registration at Williams College? Yeah, so yeah, you, you are required to actually meet with your advisor before you can register. Um, and this, that's because these meetings are so important. It's really critical uh, that, that students are having those conversations with their advisors uh, before they're making these important decisions. So that's that's one way we we one thing we use to ensure that that's happening. So uh, when you meet with your advisor, um, and, and this will not be for the, the pre-registration period that you're coming going to be doing in August, but afterwards um, you'll need to meet with your advisor, and then they will release the registration hold once they've once they've met with you, and then you'll be able to register. Um, and again, if you have any questions about that, if you you know if you're having trouble. Um, you know, uh, getting uh, getting a meeting with your advisor, or maybe they're having trouble removing the hold. You can talk to Dean Walsh or myself, uh, and we can help you navigate those things. Because we we don't want the, these holds to be a barrier, uh, but it's just something that you know it's really important that those meetings are taking place, and that's why the, the college uh, has those holds in place. That's right. Thanks, Alan. And uh, I'm gonna let you say a few words about some academic policies. All right, everyone's most ex favorite topic, very exciting, um, but really important. Uh, and so, you know, all of the college's academic policies are available uh, in, in the website, in the catalog. Uh, you can access them from the from the registrar's page, which is registrar.williams.edu. Uh, so definitely, you know, take some time to, to, to look at those that are really important. Uh, sometimes they can be confusing. Um, so please, please, please ask if you have any questions about anything you're seeing there. We are here to help you. We want you to, to, to navigate all of those things uh, successfully. Um, and really, I mean, anything that has to do with your academic record 
uh, you'll see information on in the, in the policies section. Um, you know, for example, at, at Williams College, students are allowed to take up to three courses pass-fail um, on a pass-fail basis. Uh, and this is to, to give students the opportunity to explore um, different areas, to take, to take risks. Um, and, and you know, if you get into the semester and you realize, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I bit off more than I could chew here, um, you know, you can elect to take that course pass fail. And so this, this um, section of the catalog will, will, in addition to the calendar, will um, let you know when those deadlines are and what all the different rules are around those things. Uh, Christina mentioned fifth courses earlier. Again, we are not recommending first year students take fifth courses. Um, but there may be a, a, a time in your career here where, where that might make sense for you. Again, it, it's often a situation where you want to explore something, something new. Uh, those courses have uh, some different drop deadlines. Um, so again, you can be, you know, in the middle of the semester and realize, uh, yeah, fifth course is this fifth course is too much for me. You can actually drop that course after after the. Um, a normal drop deadline for that specific course. Um, so again, it can get kind of confusing, kind of complicated. Uh, so really important to to look at look at that page and to ask questions. Um, please, please, please ask questions. We are here to help. Um, you know, every policy there are cases where an exception is appropriate. Um, you know, uh, and in the way to to navigate that if there's a situation where you know, for example, we have um, specific timeline when students are supposed to uh, have completed different degree requirements. So if you are finding that, yeah, I know I'm supposed to have, you know, a, a QFR course by this point, but it's really not working with my schedule. I have a really good reason for not doing that you know, not meeting that requirement yet, you can petition the Committee on Academic Standing. That is a group of, of faculty and administrators who um, can review those petitions. And, and, and in some cases, they'll agree with you. They'll say, you know what, you're right. This is, it's better for you educationally um, uh, to, to have an exception to this particular policy. Um, you know, sometimes uh, exceptions are not possible. Um, and oftentimes they are not. Um, you know, in particular with um, the, some of the deadlines that, that Dean Walsh was referring to earlier. There's oftentimes um, nothing that can be done with those, with those things. And uh, the, if the Committee on Academic Standing does not grant your exception, that's not appealable. Um, but again, we are here to help you navigate all that, ask us questions, um, and, and, and we, will, we will help you um, navigate all these different policies. Uh, but but don't, don't just listen to your friends. Read the policies on the catalog. Talk to us. We are we can help you. Yeah, and just to 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 put one more little emphasis on that, um, this last bullet point: how your class team can help. Uh, the two best things you can do for yourself, again, regardless of your academic confidence, please do the following: one, download that academic calendar and get in the habit of looking at it at least a couple weeks out on on the regular, um, so that you know what deadlines are coming up, even if you are absolutely convinced they will not apply to you. Secondly, the second you start feeling like, shoot, maybe I did chew off or bite off more than I could chew, or um, maybe this is just not working out for me and we're past the pass fail deadline. There, there are a number of tools in the academic tool belt at, at Williams. Some of them are listed down here. All of them have particular deadlines that are not flexible. Um, so the key uh, is to, and this is why class deans exist at Williams College, the key is to make an appointment with me, sit down, tell me what's going on. And there are a lot of different things even not listed here uh, that we can do to sort out the best um, outcome for you. Um, most students will stay in their courses, many will, will withdraw or take other options. But what you don't want to do is wind up really stressed out not having told anyone that you're struggling in a particular course and then the deadline's passed and there's very little to be done. So communicate ahead of time, be aware of deadlines ahead of time and let us know um, if you are struggling even just a little bit. Uh, with that, uh, one last slide here, a little more upbeat. 
uh, just want to say that if you haven't already checked it out, uh, if you go to uh, williams.edu and just do a quick search for first days or um, uh, first year experience, you will see in the right hand column uh, the schedule for uh, for first days 2023. Um, that schedule is still in development, but most of it is complete and accurate at this point. You can get a sense of what to expect um, during your first day experience here. What I want to emphasize on this slide is that while first days will start with a lot of really important sessions that will help you acclimate to what it means to um, be a responsible member of a college community. We are a small community. Um, we are responsible to each other uh, and to ourselves. Um, we then shift uh, later in that schedule uh, and really focus on academic preparation. And I want you to be able to see this slide to get a sense of where academics is going to be emphasized during your first day's experience. Obviously during the first class meeting, President, myself, a few other folks will be will be speaking with you. Um, you will be meeting the deans. We'll have a special session for you. Various placement exams will be happening all throughout first days. Our amazing first year outreach librarian, the library team, have this phenomenal mini golf uh, tournament set up in the Sawyer Library uh, that's really designed to help you get familiar with the layout of the library uh, and uh, and learn about those resources. Um, really important session, looking ahead to the academic life, we shift gears, we hear from the Dean of the college about um, really that transition from your orientation or what we call first days into that first day of classes and uh, getting you into that mindset. Academic Expo, you'll have an opportunity to tour uh, displays with a lot of faculty from different majors and departments, some big, some small, just so you're aware of what's out there. Um, that's super fun. We're also going to have academic support fair, um, which will include a whole lot of folks um, from our academic support teams, including our writing center, our um, quantitative uh, uh, um, peer support team. Um, just about every college student or every Williams student uses uh, peer support at some point and academic support at some point. In fact, most do during their first year. So it'll be really important for you to get a sense of how to connect with that and how to make that a regular part of your uh, student routine here at Williams. Um, there will be some additional academic advising meetings. If you're still trying to put the final touches on your schedule, you'll be in touch with your advisor about when and, and uh, uh, what time of, of, of that day to, to meet with them. Um, we'll do a special session uh, getting you ready for some STEM courses um, uh, presented by Nick Hanford, uh, who's uh, also running the WQLRA process. And then a really fabulous, these are some mandatory uh, required sessions, uh, writing your first college paper. You've probably all written amazing essays, but boy, we kick it up a notch here at Williams College. So we're going to give you a really great presentation um, that will that will hopefully um, help you feel better prepared for your first paper. And then throughout all of this, we are going to emphasize wellness. Uh, we're going to emphasize, you know, community building, connection, uh, different activities throughout for you to have, um, again, a lot of really important information to start absorbing, but also those experiences uh, that will help you start feeling grounded in your very a very new uh, world that you're going to be a part of for the next four years. And with that, uh, any final words from you, Alan? No, I think we, I think we've covered, I think we've covered enough stuff. It's so much to take in, um, but it's all really important. And, and again, uh, you know, we're, we're here to, to answer any questions you have about any of this. We definitely went over the 35 minutes. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to say thank you for your patience. We hope that this was was really helpful. We know that it's made an impact uh, since we started doing this for a lot of first years. Um, and if you have questions about it, don't hesitate to reach out to us at first hyphen year at williams.edu. Please continue to read uh, and uh, respond to the newsletters that are coming out every Tuesday for the remainder of the summer. Um, we'll be sending you reminders. If you haven't signed up for your e-ventures, please do so. Uh, we'll be doing some individualized outreach uh, uh, to those who, who haven't completed certain steps of the onboarding process. 
Um, but uh, get excited about pre-registration and we will see you on move-in day, August 31st. Thanks so much.